Hello and welcome everyone to the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. I'm Karen Lauritsen and this is meeting one about unit one. First, I'd like to thank you for your feedback so far about unit one. If you have not done so, so far, please share your feedback. Mark is gonna post a link to the Google form in the chat. It's really helpful as we continue to add and iterate on the curriculum and on Pub 101 to get your suggestions and feedback. I did note that a few of you had questions about Scribe, and I wanted to let you know that Scribe was a partner early on and still is our partner in the publishing cooperative. They worked closely with us to develop the curriculum and they're not a platform so much as a team of people who help with the publishing process. And you'll have the opportunity to meet Elvis and Mike, two people who work at Scribe, a little bit later in Pub 101 so that you can learn more about Scribe and about editing in general. So thank you for your questions about Scribe. I'll take another look at the curriculum and see if some of the initial information um, is a little unmoored and try to provide a bit more context. So today we have two presenters, not one, but two. So an action-packed agenda, which is why um, I'm wearing my hat early. Um, <clears throat> if you will join me in, um, actually, I'm going to stop. And if you have not muted, please mute your microphone. Um, and we'll do most of our chatting in the chats. And um, that way we can uh, carry on without um, unexpected uh, interruptions. So today we have two presenters and an action-packed agenda, as I just mentioned. If you will please join me in welcoming Elle Demopoulos. She's an access technologist, a ZTC OER specialist at the College of Marin. Elle is going to look at the homework with us first thing, then talk broadly with us about inclusion and accessibility. And then at the half hour, we're going to switch things up and talk with Amanda Larson. She's the open education librarian at Penn State University. And she's going to give us a preview of unit two and talk about different publishing program models. So at the end of both of their presentations, we will have time about 10 or 15 minutes to ask both of them questions. And then if you'll recall, if there are unanswered questions or if you wanna continue the conversation, we do have a shared document for that. So without any further ado, let's look at the homework. So Mark is going to put a link to the homework in chats. A few of you are already in there and we're not gonna you know, spend a whole lot of time here. And Elle has already very graciously given some point by point feedback to people who went ahead and took a crack at creating some descriptions for the images that appear in the text. Those are called alt tags. So, um, we had three images that you uh, could choose from. And really the main idea is to show that it can be done differently, but can still be done well. There's not like one perfect answer, one perfect alt tag. Um, so please, I hope that helps alleviate any shyness you may feel about um, sharing your alt tags. Um, so as we, we get started here and you guys get situated in the document, I'm going to do one of those Zoom polls and um, this is about the alt tag, so just take a second, please. And if you did try writing a description for one or more of the images in the homework, how would you rate the difficulty of the task? Not too difficult, pretty difficult, or really difficult? I, I can see what's happening here. I don't think you can yet. It's kind, it's kind of a race between not too difficult and difficult or grande and venti if you are a, a Starbucks coffee drinker. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share it so you guys can see that most of you thought it was not too difficult with, with a, about a quarter of you finding it fairly difficult. So you may remember at the end of last week, we talked briefly about accessibility and how it's best considered and really done at the beginning of a project rather than at the end of the project. And so our homework is, is uh, kind of the opposite. Um, but the idea of doing it at the beginning is so that you can spread out the work and the lift and also so that you're immersed in the context of the chapter when you're creating the descriptions for those images. You may remember that I said um, my top homework clue was context. 
And so really that's, I think, um, one of the top things you can take away from this exercise is that context is really important. And for that reason, there are a lot of project managers, people like Amanda, um, Corinne Grimont from uh, Virginia Tech, who you'll hear from a couple weeks, who say that they want their authors to do the alt tags, that it's not the job of the project manager, but rather the author since they have the subject, subject expertise. So I have one more poll for you about uh, this particular homework. Now we're interested in how much time it took you per image. This relates to our conversation about, um, you know, uh, doing it as you're creating the book rather than saving it as something to do at the end as sort of a checklist. And so if you could just share with us, did it take you no time at all, which we said would be under five minutes, some time, which is around 10 minutes, or maybe you felt like it took you an eternity, which in today's day and age we are categorizing as anything more than 10 minutes equals an eternity. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll, we can take a look. So most of you thought the lift was very manageable, under five minutes per image, um, and some of you took a little bit more time, maybe it was your first shot at creating alt tags, but none of you felt like, oh my gosh, this is going to take an eternity. However, you might feel differently if you had 80 images staring at you that all had to be described at the end of a project so that you could check that off your list. So um, I hope that's another uh, reason for you to think about doing it as you're going. So Elle, um, you gave some feedback in, in the document that people will be able to um, take a look at what their classmates wrote and some of your feedback. Do you care to say anything more about um, sort of general takeaways from the exercise? You know, I think that, as you said, context is always important. I mean, we can always think about how the image is being used and what it's doing in the text, right? So that's usually what I, I you know, lean towards. If it's a complex slide or if it has a lot of moving parts or descriptions, what I usually try to do is put that alt tag description either integrated into the text or put it as a caption underneath the image itself. That way everyone can benefit from making that described and then put a very short description of what it's doing in the text into the alt tag. You know, if we remember the whole idea of those alt tags is when you're using assistive technology and something is reading it out to you with a screen reader or a similar technology, it's going to be reading all of those descriptions, right? So if you have an image with a lot of text, that's a lot of text to kind of go through auditorily and, and you know, kind of grasp in, the, in one you know, manageable content bite. I think what's, well, go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, Please continue what you're going to say. My next suggestion was that we could look at the three images mm -hmm. um, briefly over the next five minutes, maybe starting with the pie chart, but finish your thought. Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to maybe jump into what were people's you know, impressions about how to not only look at the slide, describe it, but also thinking about what it's doing in the text itself. And when you say slide L, you're referring to the pie chart on? Right. Okay, that's, um, I labeled that if you're in the document, it's image one on page four. It's college attendance demographics, just to kind of try and get everyone looking at the same, in the same zone. Now, now Joe, I did threaten to call on you since you were the first person to take a stab at writing a description. Would you be willing to unmute and um, just talk about some of the things you were thinking about to Elle's question? Well, I, uh, I will try. Um, this is trying to convey this, this cross section of college students and how they split into these different groups. So I wanted to uh, report the, the numbers. 
in each one of the groups uh, from the largest to the smallest and try to do that. My comment was it was awfully wordy and, and that's true, but I, I, I tried to leave out anything that wasn't, I didn't think it was absolutely essential. Uh, I may be a little OCD more, more than some people. So I let, I put a lot in, but I wanted to, uh, for, for someone who can't see this picture, I wanted to enable them to get a mental image of what the picture was telling us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can really appreciate the tension between wanting to, you know, convey what's displayed and brevity. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Joe. You know, I really liked your very descriptive alt tag. I thought it was great. I, I would definitely use that as maybe a caption, right, underneath the, the image, right? So that way, when you're thinking about those images, you know, thinking, think about, okay, how am I going to encapsulate this, right, if I, if I am not seeing this on screen? And that, that doesn't only go for using assistive technology and using a screen reader, but thinking about, you know, content as an experience, right? What if we shifted the modality of that text into, let's say, an audiobook, right? Or you're looking at it on different devices, like a, like a mobile phone, right? So, you know, we, we have to keep those things in mind as well. So I think that, that uh, trying to capture every single piece of information on the slide is great, but that might be better suited to put in a, uh, like the caption or underneath the slide or underneath the image. And then, you know, really describing what's important about the image and what it's doing in the text into the alt tag. That's usually a more succinct way to get but the best of both worlds, right? Thanks, Al. Um, can, I, I may be a little confused on the purpose of the alt tag. If, if there's a reader mm -hmm. and this is a caption underneath the, 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 the graph, mm -hmm. then what would the alt tag add to it if it's going to be read by the reader right so that's a great question maybe we're thinking about it as oh well i don't want to double up this information right but the way most technology works is you can skip around in images and in alt tags and in headings. So when you're dropping down in at some technologies reading those alt tags, you know, the user can actually determine what kind of speed they want to process that at, right? So usually what happens, and if you do any kind of user experience or UI studies with those types of images, especially long descriptions of usually pie charts or math tables or, you know, some very complicated um, chart or description. Sometimes it's like an anatomy image, right, with lots of moving pieces. Most people just either put their audio on, you know, three, four, 500 words per minute, or they just skip it entirely if it's too long. Because remember, we have to think about like, how can we capture that content that's going to be easily managed, right? And thinking about that is how it works in the text. So I think we could dedicate a whole hour to this for sure. And sure. I really appreciate you um, sharing your process and your questions. And I see that many of you have added your um, descriptions to the homework document, which is great. Um, we do have to transition now, so um, if we're lucky, Elle may be able to respond to a few more of you in that mm -hmm. whole document, um, and we can look at what many of you identified as a decorative image of a classroom, which is indeed the case, and then we can also, I'll just briefly say that third image, Elle and I joked, would probably be best removed because it's such a <laughs> difficult image. So for those of you who tried to tackle that, um, well done. But it's a quarter after, and so now we're going to move into Elle's um, sort of, we're gonna zoom out, if you will, from this very detailed, how do you alt tag, how does this get done in accessibility to the, the larger picture of, you know, why are we doing this, what is our mindset? 
Um, so Elle, I'm gonna hand things over to you if you wanna go ahead and, and share your screen with us. And then to all of our um, Pub 101 mateys out there. Uh, again, I know it can be frustrating. We have so much planned. If you wanna put more questions for Elle, either in our shared document or um, as an alt tag in the homework, please do. Take it away, Elle. Okay, here we go. So as Karen said, I'm El Demopoulos. I'm the Access Technologist at College of Marin. I work very closely with two other very great and knowledgeable colleagues in this area at my college here, Susan Froman and Stacey Lentz. I wanted to give them a shout out. So we want to really think about developing an access mindset when we're, we're thinking about producing our, our, our open source text. So here's my little intro spiel. You know, most people are like, hey, is there just a checklist I can, I can use, right? You know, can, can, can I have some just best practices? Usually this happens at the very end of some design work, right? Where we're, we're going now as Karen so rightly said, now we have to go through and describe all 80 images, right? That's, that's a big workload, right? And maybe you're not in the mode of thinking about how that image is being used in text in the first place. Like what was the original reason or, or concept for using that particular image, right? So thinking about it as, we're doing it along with the rest of the design process. So access as a spectrum, you know, it really exists on a wide variety. There's no really 0%, really 100% accessibility because that's, it's really a mindset. It's not a goal, right? I like to give the example of, um, you know, a short sheet when you're making your bed, right? You know, say you got a, a king size sheet set and a California king. You know, it doesn't matter where you tug, there's always gonna be a corner that's gonna be a little shorter. So that's how you might wanna think about accessibility, 100% accessibility. You know, you're always gonna be looking at, you know, making it very accessible to some and maybe not so accessible to others. So that's really why we wanna reframe access from a to-do list as a part of an iterative design process. So I know a lot of folks are very familiar with the, the CAST model, and this is just another you know, working universal design for learning model that I wanted to put out there when we're thinking about accessibility, right? This is the working memory schematic from you know, Badly. So thinking about it as episodic and semantic, right? When we're thinking about creating content for readers or for students or for people who are experiencing this type, this type of text, we wanna think about it as, we wanna put our director's hat on, right? As Karen so, aptly has everybody has their hat on i tried to grab a uh, one of those movie clipboards but sadly since halloween is coming up they were all out of my price range but we want to really think about our content as experience right how are we producing and directing that experience and thinking about creating our content in a very modular fashion right so here's a couple of Again, UX, UI examples when we're, we're really trying to set the stage for accessibility. Try using your mouse sometime with your non-dominant hand, right? Just like writing, you'll find that it can be a little tricky. If you've ever gone to somebody's desk and doing maybe some desk sharing and they have the mouse on the wrong side, you're like, oh, it's so frustrating. Well, think about that as a, a UI accessibility use case, right? If you don't have really good headings, alt tags, and you're making that content set up for success, so when they use the technology to access it or they change the modality of your content, there's going to be some frustration there. Again, try navigating a website or any kind of document with just a keyboard. You'll find that might be a little bit more challenging 
than you think. And again, imagine your lecture or text or any kind of content you're, you're creating as a, a different type of, of modality, right? Maybe as an audiobook or a, you know, kind of a silent captioned movies. You know, think, think uh, Buster Keaton or, or Duck Soup, if uh, that's more your vein. So here is, we're getting to the, the method and the madness here, right? We're writing a text, putting our director's hat on. It's like writing a script. You know, the images, the alt tags, or the special effects, or the, the CGI of publishing, right? You know, they are supposed to add to the presentation of your content, and they should be complementary to the story you're trying to tell, right? So, you know, thinking about adding those headers as stage directions or a mini table of contents, providing context and navigational clues. Break up that content, right? I know a lot of us are familiar with Canvas. Break up that content into modules, right, or meaningful scenes to reduce the cognitive load and increase retention, right? So your content and meaning should stay the same regardless of whatever your modality is, right? Think about your content that you're producing, not just a text, right? But can that content be already primed for, for transformation? Is it transformative? And again, lastly, captions are necessary for some, but they're good for everyone. Thinking about self-care, always a good thing. You know, we have technology fatigue. So, you know, reach out, inform those communities of practice or find some that already exist. OTN is a great one. You know, I'm sure you have, you know, your local expert folks or just get on a listserv. There's lots of folks out there willing to help. You know, you can reach out to me and, you know, ask a quick question. I'm around, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer your emails either in the Google Doc or, you know, privately off, offline. You know, thinking about designing for accessibility, right? You know, as Karen said, you know, we want the subject matter experts, the authors, to really write those alt tags because they're the ones that are really thinking about how that image is being used in the context of the text, right? But that doesn't mean you have to do all of the work for accessibility yourself, right? Edit with the experts, just like accessibility or editors or illustrators, right? You can't really, editors can't really edit without something on the page. So think about accessibility as, you know, it, just one part of the iterative design process with multiple people involved, right? And again, you know, practice self-care, you know, find those communities. I'm sure Amanda will go into uh, communities of practice a little bit later when she's talking, you know, about uh, the, the models of publishing. And just make sure you're, you're not down in a deep, dark hole by yourself. This is a, not, not a solitary process. I tried to find an image that was like a, a French oublet, but I couldn't find an open source one. So if anybody has any resources, I can, I can pop that in. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Elle, very much. So I'm also going to pop um, a couple of resources in the chat that Elle um, recommends if you would like to explore this topic further. They're both videos. Um, and um, we will, as I said, um, have a chance to ask Elle some more questions um, after we hear from Amanda. But I am going to check in briefly with all of you because um, this is a transitional time and we have a minute or two. Is there, are there any outstanding questions um, that you think should be addressed right now? It's just kind of a check in. I don't want to, I, I don't want to dive in too deeply to, um, to what Elle just presented, just because I, it'll be hard to, to stop and transition to Amanda. But will those resources be in the shared doc? Yes, Tonya, mm -hmm. I will definitely put those in there. Thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I have also linked to Elle's and Amanda's slides in our um, sort of master document, what I called last week the not syllabus. So you can always see their slides uh, in our orientation plan document. 
Any other questions? That's a perfect example of the kind of question I was uh, looking for. All righty. Well, it's time for a poll. Poll number three. <laughs> this is a uh, part of our transition from talking about accessibility, which we covered in unit one, what is an open textbook, to uh, unit two, which is really looking at how to build a publishing program and some different publishing models. I know that this unit can be very overwhelming. I saw that feedback um, in the unit two course feedback. I know that many of you have very tight resources, not a lot of time, not a heck of a lot of money, and so it can be overwhelming to read about all of the possible things you can do in your publishing program and feel like I can't do 90% of those. Um, but we want to sort of put out there what publishing can entail, and we are here to help you with the process of selecting, you know, here are the things I think we can do now, here are things we'd love to do later if, you know, we had more resources. I know that Amanda can speak to that pretty directly, but I also just wanted to acknowledge it um, since I saw, the, saw your feedback. So our third and final poll for today. Hi, Karen. Yes, Mark. Sorry, just before we start the poll, um, Ponya asked if the presentations are openly licensed. Uh, L, Amanda. Uh, mine, uh, I think mine is, I didn't put the, uh, you know, CC, you know, the, the new international license on it. I think it's in the metadata for my PowerPoint, but when I uploaded it to Google Doc, it might have lost that. So thanks, Tanya, for, for keeping us honest. <laughs> my slides are always openly licensed. Um, in this case, I was deferring to the OTN. Uh, please. Uh, consider them CC by, and we can add the, the um, icon to make it more clear. Thank, yes, thank you for keeping us honest and on track here. <laughs> Thanks, Mark, too, for um, highlighting that question for us. It's easy to miss things in the chat sometimes. No worries. All righty. So in this moment, how would you rate your individual or and organizational capacity to develop an open textbook project. You're so ready. That would be classified as high capacity. You think, yeah, we could, we could do this. I'm classifying that as medium capacity. And please know which is low capacity. All right. I'm going to end the poll. You can see the company you keep. So not many people are super duper ready for this. Slightly more are definitely not ready for this. And the majority of you are feeling like maybe. So that's, that's a very understandable space. So with that information, I'm going to hand things over to Amanda, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, all of the possibilities in coming up with a publishing model. All right, so a little bit about me and my background in open publishing. Um, it actually started in my first master's degree. Um, I was the editorial assistant of the journal Nerd Theory and we started getting open access questions around whether folks could deposit their work into institutional repositories. And then in my second graduate degree, I was the open educational resources teaching assistant and we had a very do-it-yourself model. Um, it was very grassroots. Um, it was just me and Steel Wagstaff supporting faculty who were interested in OER and we had press books. And so we built a teach the teacher kind of model and then built out a community of practice. And now as the open education librarian at Penn State, um, I have much more re resources at my hand and it is sort of an institution-wide top-down kind of model and I'll talk a little bit more about what those look like but here at Penn State we have a grant initiative where we're offering people stipends and robust support to do this kind of work and then we are also participants in the pilot cohort of the publishing cooperative. So there are two mo main models that I think of when I think about open publishing. And there's the do-it-yourself model where it's one person or a very small team of people who are supporting. And um, if you're going to develop that sort of support model 
for publishing. I think that it's really important that you identify what are the limitations of your support. Um, and we'll talk about how to clearly communicate those limitations, what teaching the teacher might look like, how to build a community, and then self-care. And then for publishing program services, this is gonna be a much larger thing, and those teams are probably gonna span academic units. Um, and again, we'll want to identify who's doing the support, who the partners are, what their roles are, and then also we want to be clearly communicating not only with the faculty who are participating in our initiatives, but also with each other. And then how do you build a community there and also self-care? So identifying support. Um, one of the first questions I think anybody should really start with when they're thinking about this, whether you're doing a do-it-yourself kind of model or you have a larger team to work with, is what services are you willing or have the capacity to support? Um, are you thinking that you'll be able to help faculty facilitate brand new works? Um, can you only really handle adaptation and remixing of works? Maybe you're at the level where you can't even hit that yet and you're just thinking about adoption and you just want to dream about publishing. I mean, those are all places that are good starting points to be at. Um, and then what tools do you have available to you? One of the things that I have done here at Penn State is really thought about like, how can I build my toolbox? We're not doing just one thing because that doesn't necessarily fit everybody, but if you have to do just one thing, what does that look like? Is that Pressbooks? Is it Manifold? Is it Scribe? Is it your authors just creating modules inside their learning management system? Um, and then where are you going to host the content that you create? Um, it, will it be through one of your vendor partners? Um, Pressbooks is a good example of that. Um, or will it be inside an institutional repository? In, will you be uploading it to OER Commons? Or will it live solely inside the LMS? And if so, are there sharing options? So for example, at Penn State we have Canvas, and at Canvas you can share content inside Canvas Commons. Um, so the other thing that you want to think about when you are thinking about identifying that support is where is the money coming from for this so is it going to be a grassroots campaign where you just have access to a tool and there's not really money to support it if so then then you need to think about like who are the team members who might be supporting faculty doing this is it just you all by yourself or is it a couple of you um, and if so, are there collaborators you can lean on? Is your bookstore friendly? Can they help you with maybe print on demand? Um, or do you have the ability to either get a student worker or can you secure a teaching assistantship like I had at, at UW-Madison? And then for a large publishing program, um, largely you need to think about those same things, but also um, then the question about support is, a little broader. So is that institutional support coming from the top down? So for example, is your president or provost really interested in affordable um, and making education accessible? That's sort of the situation that we have here at Penn State. Um, or is that support coming from academic units? So it could be that your Center for Teaching and Learning is really interested in doing OER and um, or the library is really interested in doing OER and that's where the funding is coming from. And then which administrators are um, supporting your effort. It's always good to know where your money is coming from. And then who's on the team and who's gonna be doing the day-to-day -day work. So you might have a broader institution-wide sort of group who thinks about open, um, but they might not necessarily all be doing the day-to-day -day work. So when you're thinking about identifying partners, who has a seat at the table is always the question that I start thinking about. And for me, I always want that to start out with students, um, engaging students about what they need and um, figuring out sort of like the affordability landscape that they're living and thriving in at your institution is probably a really great place to start. Um, and then some common places that you can look for stakeholders is the library, Centers for Teaching and Learning, this could have a different term at your institution. Um, faculty, the bookstore, um, university presses could be interested, um, academic units, and then institutional specific units. Um, so for example, it could be like at Penn State, it could be the Shriers Honor College is really interested and they have a special unit that works on faculty support and that's who we work with. 
And then once you have identified which model you might be in and uh, what you hope that you can provide, you need to start thinking about what expectations you're going to have for your publishing program. And I know that this will be explored even more in depth later on um, with some of the other presenters in the series. Uh, but what are your expectations for faculty authors is a really great place to start. What do you expect them to give you? What materials? And then what support can they expect for you? And it's great to get this in writing before you launch your publishing program. That did not happen here. Um, uh, but we were able to really think through those models of what our support looks like. And this will be really important for folks who are doing sort of the do-it-yourself model. Figuring out what you have the capacity to support and then making sure that you're clearly communicating that to your faculty. And then I find in the situation that I'm in now, it's really important to figure out who's doing what work and defining roles really clearly. Um, so for example, our grant initiative is led by myself. I'm a librarian, but I also co-lead it with an instructional designer from Teaching and Learning with Technology. And so we've had to do a lot of scoping work to figure out what our individual roles are and who's going to be doing what kind of work. Um, maybe you have subject librarians who can help your faculty curate OER within their discipline. Um, maybe you have students who can advocate for uh, with administration for either cash for your initiative or just to get momentum going. Student groups usually have a lot of pull with administrative administrators. They pay attention to what they're asking for. And then also maybe the bookstore can help identify courses or provide print copies of OER at cost. Um, and we've had varying degrees of success throughout my time here working with the bookstore. Um, here at the flagship campus, it's pretty good, uh, but at the regional campuses, it hasn't been as great. Clear communication, and I say this can't be stated enough. Um, most of your work as a project manager for these kind of projects is going to be about clearly communicating with all of the different stakeholders in your initiative. And I find for me adopting an ethos of transparency, of being open with each group that I'm working with so that they're all getting the same message seems to have worked very well for me. Um, and creating shared language very early on, if not before you start, is a great way to begin. And one thing you might want to think about is how are you defining open and how are you defining affordable content at your institution? Um, create a memorandum of understanding or an MOU for authors that clearly details what they're agreeing to and articulates what you're going to do to support them. Um, you don't have to have this before you start, but you probably want to have it before you get your public, your projects off the ground. And there are models for that. And then communicate regularly with stakeholders and authors. And what I do for that is I just make uh, regular meetings with stakeholder groups if we're not meeting inside of like a working group. And then with authors, we communicate, we set up communication schedules during their projects. Teach the teachers. So we got a question uh, before this from Paige, and she asked, how do we offer hands-off approach while requiring basic textbook structures, uh, including learning objectives and consistency across chapters? And I think teaching the teacher, this is where that happens. So you can do it a couple of ways. You can do it by providing training around the tools that you're using, um, licensing and open pedagogy, um, so the tools that they're going to be using to create this stuff and then also how they're going to teach the stuff. But when you're thinking about the tools, it's not just about necessarily this is how you go into, say, um, Pressbooks as an example. This is how you use the editing platform. You can also talk about how you structure a textbook. Some resources you might want to create to have on hand could be a template of what you expect a book chapter to look like. Um, and I provide the textbook structure as also part of accessibility training because we want to start building in that structure from the very beginning. So you want to teach your authors to be self-sufficient and self-starters. And if you're in a do-it-yourself model, that's really going to be the best thing that you can do because there's no way that you can do every single thing. 
And so if you provide them training and then let them go off and do some of the work and then come back with questions, I find that that is a model that worked really well when we were doing sort of a do-it-yourself model at UW-Madison. Build a community. This is another great way to A, take care of yourself, um, and also to help your authors have other people who are going through this with them. Um, start small. Support only as many projects as you really feel that you have capacity to do it. That's one project to start with, and then the next time around you do two, that's absolutely fine. Um, and just grow it over time. Don't feel like you have to be churning out like a million textbooks in order to be productive. Every single one good quality OER textbook that comes out is going to help the whole movement along and provide holes to filling in the gaps that are there in sort of the textbooks. But what I would recommend is starting a community of practice. So if you have a couple of authors who are working on projects, it's a great place to introduce them to each other. Then they know that they're not alone. There's somebody else who's in the weeds trying to do the same kind of work. Um, have them share their projects, invite them to discuss what's working and what they're struggling with, because that helps you identify pain points that you can alleviate as sort of a project manager. Um, and then also, the way that this worked at UW Madison is we started a community of practice. We didn't think anybody would come. But we ended up having around people, around 30 people who came every month. And we started by scoping those. So the first one was like Pressbooks 101 and everybody could come and get like a basic tour of the editor and ask questions about how to get started and get a sandbox if they needed one to get started. And then the next one, it was like advanced Pressbooks. And we talked about H5P and annotation and other things that you could do with lessons and stuff. And then after that, we kind of turned the community of practice over to our participants and we invited faculty to come share their projects and talk through the tools that they were using. So this also doesn't have to be a huge lift on your end. Um, it should be a community project. And if you have a robust community of even a handful of people, um, they can really help do some of the development around that. So I used to work in the tower here at this library. And so I, when I think about self-care, I think about um, how isolating this work is. There's a lot of emotional labor that goes into it. Um, there's a lot of tough conversations you have to have, particularly around licensing. Um, and there's new technologies. And for some people that can be very scary. Um, and so it's really important to take time and check in with yourself as you're going through the publishing process and um, and check in with your faculty authors and make sure that they're doing okay. Um, and if you're having regular check-ins, that probably won't be an issue. But um, sometimes they're just really scared to get started and it's okay if you're also really scared to get started. Like this has a steep learning curve, but it's not insurmountable. Um, so this work can be hard, but instead of a tower isolated, we could think of ourselves as lighthouses and we could build a network. We can set boundaries. Um, one thing I have found that really helped me with dealing with faculty who asked really tough questions, and this is useful not only in uh, sessions that you might have with them around OER, uh, but also like at larger institution-wide conversations that you're having. So we have a symposium and there's always a presentation on OER and there's always like this one curmudgeonly faculty member who shows up and asks the quality question. And um, if you set up, you realize what questions you're getting commonly and which ones are really tough to answer, you can sort of pre-plan and map out those answers so that it's less anxiety inducing in the moment. And I found that that is one thing that has really helped me. And then the other thing that I would really like you to take away from this is that you don't have to master everything. You have Pub 101 here for help, and there's a large community of people who are doing this kind of work, and we are all really helpful to sit down and talk about like what worked for us and what didn't. And um, so go forth and be happy. And then considerations. These are just takeaway points that you should have in your mind as you're thinking about um, your capacity. So 
is there a difference between your capacity and your organization's capacity? And then um, what point does your public does your publishing program um, how are you going to approach it um, your capacity with that and then what are you prepared to support now and what might you dream about supporting later what conversations do you need to have in your organization to better answer those questions and who could you partner with to make this work easier Thank you, Amanda, for sharing your stories and for leaving us with those questions. So as a reminder, there are links to Amanda and Elle slides in our Hub 101 orientation document. Um, Amanda also answer, uh, excuse me, recommended practicing answering tough questions. And we do have a list of tough questions um, that I'll share with you so that you can sort of see um, what is frequently asked and, and think about how you may want to answer them. So as promised, we have some time set aside to ask questions. So I noticed some of you have gone ahead and, and put them in the shared document, which is great. But since we have some time left, feel free to unmute and ask your questions of Elle or Amanda, or go ahead and post them in the chat and take advantage of their um, time with us here. This is when I pause and wait for you guys to jump in. I have a question. Uh, this is Tanya Farrell from UNO. Um, it's semi-related to Elle's presentation mostly. Um, we're working with a faculty author and they we sat down and he asked, you know, what supports we would be providing. And his example was, will you be providing images for the text? And I was kind of taken aback because I just assumed if you're writing the text, you will be the one providing the images where you feel it is appropriate as the content person. So he doesn't even want to potentially provide images, let alone alt tags. So what kind of advice would you give in that sort of situation? Is that something that makes sense or coming from an accessibility standpoint, is it really important that they're the ones to be involved in that process? Well, I think that's, it's two separate questions you're really asking, right? You're, you're asking a little bit about the overall design of the content and also if there's an accessibility piece to that design. And as far as bringing, you know, a kind of like a, a stock image collection bank of already described images, I know there are a few things that are out there, but they're, they're all paid and, you know, they don't really align with the mission of OER. Um, so like I'm thinking about like getting images and things like that. So you know, that's something that you would have to navigate with the faculty themselves. Um, I don't know if I can answer that, but as far as the accessibility piece, if they don't want to have images, then they don't want to have images, right? That's one way to, to go about not really thinking about you know, the, the technical details of the alt tags, but it misses the the point of access and accessibility, right? Thinking about it as a design element in the workflow of the entire content product, right? You know, what happens when there's another accessibility piece, right? Or, you know, there's you know, a book design piece or an editorial piece or an illustration piece, right? You know, that should be just one part of an iterative design that, you know, you can kind of come back to and work with as experts. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Tanya, it's, it's a great question and it gets at a lot of different things, including that open license education that can be very involved and as Amanda said, can sometimes lead to, you know, difficult conversations or some serious emotional labor. Um, so I know, you know, what a lot of your colleagues will do are share resources just as Adrian did in the chat and point faculty to, you know, here are some places where you can find openly licensed images. They have to be openly licensed. You will want to keep track of where they come from. And we do have a spreadsheet 
um, in the Canvas course for just that, for you know, helping organize where the images came from, what the licenses are, you know, what proper attribution is. It's it's um, you know a lot of work uh, to sort the images, so I think that's why sometimes faculty authors will look for other people to help with that work. Um, and so I think providing those resources or defining the expectations based on perhaps their subject area. You know, do they need images in, in their, their math textbook? You know, some of us would say absolutely and other people may argue, you know, not that much. They'll have formulas acting as images, but that's yet another um, sort of subset conversation. So many of you are chatting in the chat, which is wonderful. Are there um, others of you who would like to unmute and ask questions of one another or our guests? Hi, Karen. There was a question from Cheryl in Arizona. Um, she said, if people have used Manifold for OER publishing, she'd like to hear about their experience. Um, I think that Amanda has answered that to some degree, but if there's anything else you want to add um, already, <laughs> please go ahead. Speaking of the chat, Michaela had a question um, about, I think, the accessibility uh, related homework. And she said, I wondered if some of these warranted links to long descriptions. I'm not sure. I, I, Elle, do you understand the question? I, I think I might need some more information. Yeah, I, you know, I have an idea, but maybe uh, they can jump on and, and maybe expand a little bit. Hey, this is Michaela. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Michaela. Hi. So in some accessibility guides that I've seen, well, well, to give some context, we have a lot of um, careers and trade programs here that have like really, really complex diagrams and things that are hard to uh, represent in a few sentences. And sometimes our accessibility department recommends like linking to a longer description. Uh -huh. um, or sometimes they actually say that the image is so complex and difficult to convey that they actually recommend tactile, like creating tactiles instead. So I just wondered with really complex information, if it's sometimes better, if it's more than a to link out to a long description, or maybe sometimes better to work with the accessibility department to create tactile um, models. Hmm. You know, that's a, that's a great question. And I would really have to see the content to really give you a great answer. <laughs> um, I can give you a basic overview of what I would, how I would approach that problem. I, I, I think that that's, that's a, uh, an issue of like what, how can we keep the content accessible, but also, you know, really adhere to best practices for you know making it modular making it you know bite-sized and, and manageable right so that's what i was th thinking about when we're talking about the the long descriptions or the expanded descriptions of like the pie chart in example one right where we're you know we're taking those long descriptions and using that as a, a caption and then maybe just being very succinct about what the image is actually doing in the alt tag. That way we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. And if your document is formatted appropriately, when you go to convert it, it'll have that metadata in the background that allows the user to either, you know, rewind and replay that content or skip around in those headers and those document descriptions and image descriptions to, you know, really get the content that they want to have, right? So if somebody wants to experience and really read the very long and, you know, descriptive, you know, content that you, you put in there in that label underneath the caption, which a lot of you, you know, did a great job at, you know, they can actually access that and they can replay that 
as much as they would like, or if they just want to skip that description and be like, oh, this is a pie chart that's, you know, showing, you know, the very small sliver of traditional students in undergrad. That's what the image is doing. So I don't really have to go into all the numbers, right? I understand what that image is doing in the text, right? So they can pick and choose how they're going to really interface with that content, you know, on their own, right? But you want to give them the option to engage with it how they would like, right? So that kind of gets into the idea of, well, how complex is too complex, right? Then that's an issue maybe for your own local accessibility department and a very, you know, subsection of, you know, when we're talking about math or anatomy or any kind of those really heavy fields that require, you know, a really good amount of information in a short amount of space, you know, we can talk offline about that and it depends on what kind of content you're doing. And again, we're not always going to get 100% accessibility for all populations and all users, right? So we have to think about that. what kind of populations are we serving, right? Is it content for a general audience or are we making it specifically for, you know, somebody who's going to be using a screen reader or somebody who's going to be interfacing it with an online only environment, right? So I think those are some of the considerations we have to, to think about. Thank you, Elle. There have been a lot of other questions um, related to our homework, and a few people are looking for specific guides, recommendations, um, you know, something that they can turn to, maybe a policy on accessibility and alt texts in particular. So perhaps that's um, something that we can link to from the shared document later because we are running out of time. We have three minutes uh, remaining. Um, I will just point to, um, as sort of our, our last question that I think we can squeeze in in these last three minutes, is from Stephanie about that image three in the homework, which we sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge said, I'm not sure this image should be here at all because it's um, really difficult. So Stephanie asked, if the author thought it was good information and wanted to include that image, would it be worth breaking it down into individual images, each with their own alt tag? Um, or, you know, would we sort of stand, stand um, strong and say, mm, this image isn't really serving a, a, a purpose that warrants that kind of effort? Elle, what's your vote? You know, what I would say to that is perhaps that's work that you would do with the designer, right? You know, we, I have a close cohort of folks who do instructional design and, and things of that nature. And I would reach out to folks in that area as far as what their recommendations are. But for me, I would probably look at maybe designing another image that would be more useful in that particular context. What do everybody else, uh, you know, what do they think about that? And, and Jeremy pointed out in the chat that it's a common meme format and that was a student produced content. So uh -huh. I really like your point there, Jeremy, in the chat that it's an attempt to be relevant, maybe more so than convey needed information. And to Elle's point in reaching out to instructional designers for support, I feel like that's a really nice note for us to end on because it's something both Elle and Amanda talked about in terms of how to take care of yourself, how to reach out and form a community, how to get support from other people so that you don't feel like you have to answer all of these questions by yourselves and know how to do all of these things on your own. Mm -hmm. um, it's really uh, much better to, to reach out and, and ask for help and ask for support. And that's um, one reason why we're all here. So please join me in thanking Elle and Amanda. And I thank all of you for joining us for this Pub 101 meeting and look forward to seeing you next week when we will talk uh, more about MOUs, which are covered in Unit 2. So for your homework, please take a look at Unit 2 and prepare any questions you may have for Carla Myers, our guest from Miami University. She is a uh, copyright librarian and can answer all sorts of questions uh, related to MOU and copyright. So until then, 
Farewell.